Welcome, and thank you for joining us again today. We're going to be looking into the, uh, the discipline of prayer and trying to understand it. I think it's very misunderstood and among many Christians and certainly not understood well by non-Christians. And so I thought it'd be a healthy conversation to kind of look through the text of Scripture and, and see what it has to tell us about praying. So let's get into it. Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus was out on a hillside praying, and his disciples came to him with that question. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Well, think about it. These are Jews. They've been raised on the law of Moses. They've been raised attending synagogue weekly. They've heard the scriptures read. They've been praying through all their religious feasts, whether it be Passover, or the Feast of Tabernacles. and They've been doing this all their life. These are people that we would consider raised in the church. And here's Jesus walking along, and they said, teach us to pray. Just like John's disciples taught him that this is unusual. This, this is strange for people who've been praying and involved with, with a relationship with God all their lives um, to ask Jesus how to pray. And it, it lets you know that uh, prayer must be important. That even though they had been engaged in religious rituals all their life, they recognized there was something about Jesus praying that they needed. And so they asked him. Matthew chapter 6 tells us, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. There is so much going on in that prayer. I know it's a prayer that if, if you've been raised in the church, you've heard it many times, but boy, we really need to break it down and understand what uh, what Jesus is saying. He and, and I don't believe he's saying, pray this prayer every day and you're fine. No, he's showing us the model for prayer. And, and we need to understand how and what he's modeling that we need to we need to get into. So he talks about when, when you keep on pray, when you pray, don't babble like pagans, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. In many pagan religions, and even I'm afraid in some Christian congregations, people have this idea that if they pray a lot and a long time, that somehow their words will be heard more. When the Bible speaks specifically against it, that, it, that it, you know, your spirituality is not measured by how long the prayer is, but by how well your heart is connected to our Father in heaven. And so he's saying, look, don't, you don't have to keep babbling like pagans do. You don't have to make just pile up verbiage, and somehow that will impress God, because that does not impress God. In fact, usually the opposite. 
And he, Jesus is very clear. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Now that sort of begs a question. But it is as, it's interesting. To, to, he, he absolutely knows what you need. So you got to sort of sort of wonder, well, if he already knows what I need, why do I have to pray? You ever thought about that? Has that ever come across your mind? You know, if God knows everything I need, I, I should just get it, right? I, he should just give it to me. Um, and yet, as a father, I kind of start to understand this that you want your children to ask even when you know what they need, mostly because you want them to know you're the one providing it. You want to be appreciated. I remember once my daughter, you know, said, oh, I'll, I'll pay you back everything you've paid, all the money you've, you've paid for me. And she had no idea what she was talking about and certainly no idea how much I've, money I've put out for her. But the, I, I, my response was, I, I don't want you to pay me back but I would like to be appreciated. I would like there to be a little gratitude involved. I'd like you to recognize that until you're an adult and independent and have your own job and your own place, that I am working hard to provide for you. And all I ask is for a little appreciation. I'd just like you to acknowledge that dad's helping me out here. And, you know, I kind of have a feeling God feels the same way, that, that, no, he doesn't want us to pay us back. He knows we can't. But he does want us to know it's him who is providing, that he is the one who cares for us, who provides for us, who protects us. And we need to know that that has a whole lot to do with our own relationship with God, is recognizing all that he does for us. So how do we think of God when we pray? Because that's a whole other aspect of this. I mean, when you think of God, what's your picture? What's that picture in your head? Is it the, the sort of clouded substance looking like a human being, sitting on a big throne, everything's white, and he's sort of contemplating the, the, the needs of the entire globe, the entire universe is held together by him? Or do you see him as, as, as that gotcha God? He's just waiting to find you doing something wrong, and he's trying to catch you, and then he'll punish you. I mean, what do you think of? Is he an indulgent grandparent? Is he a merciless tyrant? Is he a vending machine? You just pray, and he gives you what you want? Is he Santa Claus? You know, if you talk to him enough and you're real good, maybe once a year he'll bless you. What's your image of God? What's your picture when you... What, what's your relationship with him and how that all works together? Because how we see God, what kind of relationship we have in, in, in our own imagining of what God is, who God is, and what he does for us, has everything to do with how we pray. And so we need to talk about that. You need to think about that. Our image of God, our understanding of our relationship with God is, 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 is intricately connected with the process of prayer. How do we approach him? Do we recognize who he is? And I think that's a part of Jesus' model here in the Lord's Prayer. He starts out, our Father in heaven, recognizing the relationship. He is our Father. He created us. Hallowed be your name, reverence, awe, respect. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus starts out addressing his father with great respect, recognizing who he is. And unlike Jesus, we all need to recognize that not only is our father in heaven, but he's God. And we're not. And we just kind of need to get a grip on that. He's God. We're not. And so Jesus says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom, not ours, come. 
your will, not ours, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, how many of us actually pray like that? I know when I was growing up in the church, I prayed for everything that I wanted. I prayed for my will to be done. I prayed that God would give me all the blessings I thought I deserved, and a few that I didn't. But I had this idea that he was there to just make my life better. To, and, and again, better according to my will and not necessarily according to his will. And God has a way of uh, rearranging how your prayers come out. As one theologian put it once, isn't it great that God answers us according to his will and not ours? And I think that's, that's absolutely true. Your will, your kingdom, which means I'm just glad to be here. I'm just thankful that I'm a child of God and that he's using me in his kingdom. But my job is not to figure out what I want to do. It is not to get God to do what I want to do. But it is for me to figure out what God is doing and how I can join him in that process. Heaven came down. And glory filled my soul, as the hymn goes. But you notice Jesus isn't really focused on getting us to heaven. We have this idea that Jesus came to earth, he died for us, and he washed our sins away, and now we're all saved and we can go to heaven. And that's true. But that's not, that's not the focal point. He's focused on heaven coming down here. He's asking God, to bring your kingdom to earth, on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we're not just supposed to, you know, sit around here biding our time while we're alive, twiddling our thumbs, trying to be good, go to church every Sunday, and, and finally we'll die and go to heaven, and that's, that's the whole point. No, that's not the whole point. This prayer makes that very clear. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and he already made a great example of this. God was constantly, through the Old Testament, making his presence known on earth. And then he sent his own son. When Jesus was born in that manger and grew up to preach and teach people in Galilee, heaven had been sent down. Heaven had come down and was here with us. He walked among us. And he asks us to do the same. We're supposed to pray the same. We're supposed to become godly people. Our, 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 our prayers should reflect that mission, that while we're here on earth, until we get to heaven, and we all have that great promise, we live now based on that future reality, but what we do now is extremely important about bringing heaven to earth. Our prayers need to reflect our desire to bring heaven to earth. Is that how we pray? Are we concerned with bringing heaven to earth? Or are we just trying to get God to bless us here until we get there? Because I think that's a problem. I know that was a problem in my early years of prayer before I had much understanding. And here's the key. For us to reflect heaven on earth, we desperately need to be transformed into heavenly beings, rather than the worldly ones that we are. The world has way too much influence here. And so when we pray, when we pray about bringing heaven down to earth, we actually need to be praying that God will bring heaven, godliness, Christ-likeness into our lives, that we will be transformed from the, the emotional scars and the spiritual damage that's been done by this world, and, and that we can be transformed into a godly disciple of Christ, following Jesus in such a way that when people see us, they will in fact not see us, but see the great God that lives within us, the presence of God, heaven on earth. 
and then God will be glorified when we actually display his family resemblance in our lives. The people around us will take notice. They'll say, hey, that's different. That's not worldly. There must be a divine presence here. And that's what all Christians should be hoping for and praying for. There's another part of this that I think is incredibly important. Uh, he, it's often translated, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And I think we get a little messed up there when we think, well, this is about money. If you loan somebody money and stuff like that. No, this is about people who wrong you or wrong or you've wronged them and, and vice versa. It's saying, forgive us our sins, our transgressions, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And, and we all know it's part of the prayer and you should pray it. But have you ever really stopped to think about what you're saying? You're asking God to extend the same amount of grace, the same amount of forgiveness to you in relation to how much you extend to those around you. You want him to forgive you the same way you forgive others. And the question is, is that what you really want? Do you really want God to use you as the measuring stick for how much grace he should give you? I'll tell you, when this, this first hit me, it, it, it was a, a mind-exploding experience. When I realized I'm actually praying that God pours the same amount of grace on me that I'm allowing others to have around me. Because I'll, I'll have to admit it was such a mind-blowing experience because I wasn't that forgiving. And in fact, I was, I was pretty heavy on the judgmental and self-righteous side of things. And when I recognize that he's, he, we're actually praying, God will use us as the measure. That should scare the hell out of you, literally. Do you want God to use us as the measure? And if that's what we're praying, and the fact is that's what he's going to do, whether you pray it or not, it should be a big motivation. It was a huge motivation in my life that I needed to actually start forgiving people, that I needed to be a whole lot less judgmental and a whole lot more grace-oriented. I wanted the grace that God was pouring on me to extend out as much as possible so that he would extend more grace to me. And so I had to start learning things. I had to learn to forgive my parents for their mistakes. And one of the big reasons for that was, was so that my own children might forgive me for my mistakes. I had to start extending grace to friends that had hurt me, friends that had done things to me that I thought, oh, I can never forgive that. Well, if you can't forgive that, God's not going to forgive you. And I took that to heart. And so I started forgiving those unforgivable things because I knew I had done some pretty unforgivable things myself. That, that, that this should be a tremendous humbling experience for us before God. It should strip away the pride. It should strip away the arrogance. And it ought to give us a real reality check on where we're at in our own faith walk, in our own journey getting closer to God. Because the, more, the closer you get to God, the more grace should be flowing out of you the more forgiveness should be happening. Because the Bible's very clear here, bad relationships here on earth have a very profound influence on our relationship with God. If you're bitter against anyone, if you're filled with hatred towards someone, it will poison all of your other relationships, including your relationship with God. And so there comes a point where you have, to, you have to let it go and you say, oh, I just can't, for well, do you want God to forgive you? And the answer is yes. And so if we want God to forgive us, it is mandatory that we start forgiving others. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not and I want you to notice, it doesn't say might not. He says your father will not forgive your sins. And that's something we need to take deeply to heart. Not from a fearful standpoint, but from a transforming standpoint. 
It needs to transform us into incredibly merciful, loving, forgiving souls so that once again the Spirit of God will be seen in us and not turn people away because of our worldly spirit. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is an amazing passage, and it hits home very well. If any parent knows that, you know, they're going to try to give their children all the things they didn't have or all the, the gifts that they need to, to grow up and become independent, to become somewhat self-sufficient, or as I like to say, uh, as a Christian, I want to teach my children to be God-sufficient, uh, to let them know they need to take all of their needs and cares and worries and fears to God. And, and he's pointing out, if you as, as human beings who are filled with, unfortunately, sinful thoughts and actions, you who are evil, only God is good. Jesus tells us that. And he says, though you are evil, how you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does your father? You know, God doesn't have all of our human weaknesses. How much more is he going to give us? And listen to what he says. He doesn't just say, give us anything. We ask, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And so in, in several studies, we've, we've talked about this, and they're like, oh, so God will just give us whatever we want? No, no. He actually tells you what to pray for. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, if we can be filled with, with God's Spirit, if we can start having God's priorities, God's values in our life, then everything we're going to ask him for are the very things he wants to give us. But if we have become self-absorbed, if we have become arrogant, if we have become self-righteous, we're going to be asking him for things that he will not give us. Or even worse... He might give it to us to punish us. So we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to be given to us so that especially when we pray, we know we'll be praying for God's priorities. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what are the takeaways from this? Well, let's look at it. How do we see God when we pray? I think this is this is worth taking some time to to maybe read, you know, that opening in Isaiah where it talks about the, the presence of God fills the whole temple. We need to we need to sort of get a get a grip on who God is. Read those passages in Exodus where where lightning and thunder and clouds were on top of Mount Sinai as he gave the law and the people were afraid to approach the mountain lest they be killed. We need to we need to get a grip on who God is and how incredibly awesome he is. He's the creator of the universe, and he's a loving father. And we need to learn to approach him like that. And, 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 and one of the things that's amazed me is just how many Christians who've been raised in the church just don't spend that much time in prayer. And that tells me they're they're just not connecting with the Heavenly Father. I mean, this is the creator of the universe. This is the one who is in charge. This is the one who can do all things. Why wouldn't we want to talk to him on a regular basis? Why wouldn't we want to bring our troubles and our, our, our fears and our anxieties to him? How do we see God? And that will affect how we pray. Our image of God directly influences our understanding of the, of the purpose of prayer, our, our understanding of how to practice it. And once we start connecting with that, we'll want to spend more and more time praying and listening to God. This is critical. Broken relationships, bitterness, hate, 
the lack of forgiveness will block, will completely impede our ability to interact with God. In one of my recent Bible studies, we were talking about how husbands should treat their wives, and it was saying you need to treat your wives well, that you need to be uh, caring and, and merciful. And, and the last little phrase there in Peter is he says, lest your prayers be blocked, impeded. And the message there is, you know, husbands, if you're not treating your wives right, God's not going to listen to you. He puts you there to take care, to provide for, protect take care of her in, in a godly manner. And if you're not, he's not going to listen to you until you change that. And that's, the, that's one of the most important, you know, when we talk about our relationships, we often think of everybody else except our own family. But the fact of the matter is our, our relational practice, our faith display of who we are and, and how we treat people starts right there in your home, right there with your spouse and with your children. And, and if you're not treating them in a godly manner, the rest of your practice is pretty worthless. That, that, that everything we do, every bit of our testimony needs to flow right out of our home and into the world around us. So don't let broken relationships block your relationship with God. And if you've got some broken relationships, I would start praying about those immediately and asking God to give you wisdom on how to at least do your part in healing those relationships. Romans 12, it, it says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. It recognizes the other person has a vote. The other person may not feel like having peace right now, but you, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. Here's one of those things that I think most people just do not understand, and it's critical. Because if you've been listening carefully to all this, you'll recognize that prayer has a lot to do with us getting out of the way and letting God take over. And so when we pray, prayer is not about changing other things or other people. And I know a lot of you are thinking right now, oh man, I've been praying that so-and-so would change. I've been praying my wife would, you know, clean the house better. I've been praying my husband would, you know, be a little more relational and then spend more time with me. I, but you, we often pray that God will change somebody else or everyone else. And that's not what prayer is about. God wants us to approach him in our father-child relationship so that we will be changed, so that we will be transformed into his likeness. You know, if you want to be like somebody, you need to be around them a lot. And, and it's usually because we're around them a lot that we want to be like them, because there's something about them that is different. So when we hang out with God, he starts changing us. He starts transforming us into his likeness. When we pray for the Holy Spirit, he gives it to us and allows us to be sculpted and, and, and worked on and, and gets his hammer and chisel out to, be, to create in us a beautiful gem, a beautiful, precious stone that will reflect his family resemblance. That's what he wants for us, and that's what we should want for us. So when we pray, let's try not to let the world creep in. I think that's one of the most important parts about prayer is to, is to shut the world out and to talk to our Father in heaven, who happens to be the creator of all things, and let him transform us into the person that he created us to be so that we can call for his kingdom and for his will to be done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for joining us.